Good afternoon all and thank you for joining our employment law webinar focusing on breach of confidence and post-termination restrictions. Our speaker today will be Adam Hugel, a partner at Hugel & Ip, who was recently ranked as a leading individual for employment law in Hong Kong, and Counsel Earl Deng from here at Dennis Chang's Chambers and also ranked as a Tier 1 employment barrister in Legal 500. Unfortunately, in light of the emerging fifth wave of COVID, we are unable to have a physical audience here today. However, we look forward to seeing you in person at one of our future events. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to our speakers. Thank you, Taylor, uh, and welcome to everybody online. And thank you also to Dennis Chang's Chambers for hosting us. Um, as Taylor mentioned, uh, we're hosting this in an empty room due to COVID restrictions. We had hoped to be able to have a live audience since we could have a lot of interactive Q&A um, and back and forth discussion, but unfortunately we're not able to do that. Um, I think everybody should be set up with a system that allows them to ask questions. And so if you want to type any questions uh, as we go through, we'll compile all of those and look at them at the end uh, and try and help you answer them. So as Taylor mentioned, the topic we're discussing today is essentially liability for employers to protect themselves, sorry, sorry, the ability for employers to protect themselves from their employees. Now, we always hear that in a business, the employee is the greatest asset. Um, but when employees are leaving a business, employees often become the greatest risk to the business. Um, indeed, in certain circumstances, they become absolute nightmares. Um, and in that regard, I'm thinking of team moves, where a group of employees get together um, and orchestrate a move where they all walk out um, systematically, and the employers essentially left um, losing an entire department, a series of revenue, and everything else. Now is about the time of the year when these issues come to fruition. Um, most bonuses are paid around about New Year, Chinese New Year, and most employees are savvy enough that they're not going to move employers until they've received their bonus. And so it's fairly apt timing um, that we're having the seminar now. Uh, whilst the seminar is primarily looking at um, protection for employers from the acts of their employees, um, that was also the time of the year where employees are let go, um, made redundant um, in the first quarter of the year. And quite often, this is the time when employees come to us with their employment contracts in hand, probably haven't read them for a few years, looking at the post-termination restrictions, probably for the first time, and asking whether they're enforceable or not, and how those post-termination restrictions are going to impact the ability for the employee to get a new job, um, start new employment, etc. Okay, so we've mentioned that employees can pose a risk to the business whilst employed, sorry, uh, employees can pose risk to the business. This can happen whilst they're both employed and um, post-termination. So whilst employees are employed by a business, they've got access to vast quantities of information. Um, sometimes they have access to all of the information and data belonging to a business, uh, client lists, et cetera, pricing. Um, and they also have the ability to interact with their colleagues, um, and that's how they would get together and orchestrate team moves and the like. Of course, the risk tends to um, really reach a pinnacle when employees start to leave. And it's that time when the employer panics, um, uh, especially when the employee um, has indicated or strongly suspects that they're going to go to a competitor. The employee pan uh, employer panics and um, reaches for the post-termination restriction and seeks to see what they can do to, to protect themselves from competition. The fear that all employers have, um, and especially HR, is when they pull the contract out of the file, they look through it and they see that the employee's been around for many years, and actually they only signed something like an offer letter or a very bare bones employment contract, and it doesn't actually have any restrictions in it um, that help protect the employer. Um, very recently I dealt with such a case. Fortunately, we were on the side of the new employer and the departing employees. Um, they were all in professional services, there were about 10 of them, and they essentially um, all left their previous employer and moved together. Uh, the previous employer pulled their employment records and saw that the employment contracts were literally two or three pages long, mentioned things like um, notice, uh, payment, annual leave and the like, and had nothing in there at all to protect confidential information and certainly nothing to protect working for a competitor. And obviously uh, the employer became very crestfallen and concerned as to what to do. So in circumstances like this, um, 
uh, we're, sorry, uh, in circumstances like this, we're actually looking to start the presentation um, slightly differently to the way we normally would. And instead of looking at the express um, contractual clauses in an employment contract, we're going to look at the implied terms that apply to all employees, whether or not they have a contract, whether or not the contract's properly drafted or not, because that's the starting point that all employers need to rely on to protect themselves. Um, and fortunately, Earl Deng has agreed to pick up on this side of things, and so I'll hand over to Earl to deal with implied contract terms. And then, as we can see from the slide, we will come on to express contractual terms, uh, including confidentiality and post-termination restrictions afterwards. Uh, just before I hand over to Earl, we do mention criminal conduct, and very often um, we see when employees leave one employer, especially if they're suspected of taking confidential information um, or some other employer products. One of the cases I dealt with was sort of pencil case handbags that they accused the employer of stealing. Um, the employer quickly runs to the police. The police can be pretty receptive to start with um, and will conduct something of an investigation. But in my experience, as soon as they realize that it's an employee-employer dispute, um, they quickly essentially push it aside and uh, leave it to be dealt with through the civil courts. And so with that, um, I hand over to Earl. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, again, uh, it's quite unfortunate that we can't have an interactive session. Uh, we're actually looking, quite looking forward to it, to being able to meet everyone uh, in, in the flesh, so to speak. Um, but here we are. Um, I'm going to be covering today uh, the breach of confidence in a little bit of detail. But um, again, when looking at the breach of confidence, um, one can't just look at it in isolation, one, especially in the employment context. One will be looking at it in terms of the wider question of fiduciary duties, fidelity, and any other implied terms in which uh, the employer can protect themselves with. Um, so today we'll be going to be focusing a lot on the law of confidence as well as uh, fidelity and good faith. Um, there will be some talk on accessory liability, but we're just going to be uh, glossing through that for the purpose of today's talk. Um, and just to round things off, and after Adam's uh, section on restrictive covenants and express terms, um, we'll briefly go over uh, remedies, and um, I'm going to cherry pick a couple of what I feel to be interesting developments and decisions in relation to damages. So um, starting with uh, the common law cause of action, um, obviously we're talking about the breach of confidence today. Um, and usually there's a tension as to, is the information actually confidential? Is it in public? Is it uh, merely confidential? Or is it a trade secret? And um, there's also the tension as to, is taking it sufficient? Or does someone who has taken that confidential information have to use it uh, in order for a claim to be established? Um, for duties to employers, everyone talks about fidelity. And uh, a slightly more modern term now is in good faith. Um, but a lot of that stops when the employee leaves. And so um, over the last 15, 20, 30 years, there's been a progressive development on the question of can an employee who is not a director of the company or a shareholder uh, be held to the standards of a fiduciary. Um, so moving to breach of confidence, um, this is a Everyone will know Coco and Clark, um, the three-stage test. Um, the most important thing here is that uh, this obligation of confidence is, impl is implied by the common law into every single contract. So as Adam was saying, even if you have an employee who has been uh, employed for many, many years and has a bare bones employment contract, there will be some protection accorded by the common law. So. Um, for those who practice actively in this area of law, um, you'll note that the three categories of information is from the case of Facenda Chicken. Um, I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly, but uh, this has been applied to uh, in Hong Kong it, by the Court of Final Appeal in the PCCW Aitken case. Um, you will note that between the three categories of information, they, they're not always static. And um, information that was confidential can obviously become public, um, but it's less common with trade secrets. Um, but with the case law and the authorities that have been decided over the years, um, trade secrets used to be very, very close to designs and patents, but they've obviously expanded 
uh, in, to include um, you know, business plans, how things are done, etc. So um, we're now seeing more and more of trade secrets that become merely confidential and then subsequently become public information. Um, in terms of uh, the law of confidence, it protects only categories two and three, obviously. Um, the benefit of a finding that information is a trade secret and not merely confidential is that category three information can be enforced post-employment. So if the employee uses it after uh, he leaves your employment, then that cause of action can still bite even though he has left your employment. Um, however, um, it's also important to note that in the development of the common law, category two, the, the courts have progressively recognized um, protection of category two, uh, in, not, not so much in the context that it's actionable on matters done afterwards, but um, they, re they, they recognize that an employee who actually physically or digitally takes the information uh, at that, when he is employed, that can be actionable. So um, in, in this slide, we talk about um, how category two type information can still be protected, or at least the employer has a cause of action against the employee who has already left employment. So the first point is post use is not protected, but the act of copying or making a list and taking documents while you, the employee was in uh, employment, that is, that, that is actionable. So, I've cited Robin Green, and I think Adam made a snide comment about citing an 1895 case while we were preparing this. Yep. <laughs> but it's the classic case of copying lists of names and addresses of customers. Uh, universal thermosensors, um, again, taking a list and then using it in your own business subsequently. Um, th there is also uh, a Gilman case in Hong Kong, uh, which is uh, about uh, whether a list was actually made or not. And in that case, because there was no physical list made, it was all in the memory, uh, the, the employer did not succeed there. Um, so that's one situation in which uh, post-employment uh, uh, post -employment situation can still, uh, the, the employer still has recourse in a post-employment situation. The second one um, is uh, an obiter comment by uh, Lord Justice Neal in Fatenda Chicken and Fowler. Uh, where instead of using the uh, category two type confidential information as part of his skill and knowledge in the new, uh, new job, the employee just basically sells it out to a uh, third party who then uses it um, and gets a head start on the new business. Um, that has been uh, identified by Neil J, a uh, new, new Lord Justice Neil, as a area in which the law may attract some protection. Um, but uh, so far, there's been no real development in that aspect of the case. Um, another one that is slightly more modern, um, especially with high-end digital photography and everything being put public and online, um, is the Force India uh, Formula One and Aerolab case. And this is quite a, f quite a famous uh, case and I'm sure many of you know about it. Um, and the, uh, the Court of Appeal in England basically held that it is not even if a piece of information is out in the public domain. If you had previous access to it when it was imparted in uh, circumstances of confidence, if you don't use the publicly available information and you use your own information, then tough luck, um, you're still abusing and using confidential information. So um, this is a very interesting case um, on the facts because in Force India, uh, Force India was actually the worst performing car uh, of that season. And Team Lotus, who was actually rejoining the Formula One circuit at that time, decided to hire, hire the aero consultants who had been helping Force uh, India. And for some reason, the aero consultants decided that it was a good idea to use the worst performing car in that season to then develop a new car for the client. Um, Aerolabs argued that when they were working on the new Team Lotus designs, um, the force of new cars were already racing, uh, bits of the, the wings had been sold off as memorabilia, and there were detailed pictures and videos of how the uh, 
the, 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 the car was in public, and therefore the information was already in the public domain. And so um, the court took a very, very narrow view of that and said, basically, you used the CAD uh, drawings to start off uh, developing your new car. And so therefore, the court focused on the CAD drawings and said that because they provided uh, uh, Team Lotus with a head start, um, Aero Labs, who were their consultants, was therefore liable for breach of confidence. Um, but what um, the, the, the court held was important in relation to damages on this point, because they said that the information was already in the public domain. They could have reversed engineered those uh, properties of the wings and the car, et cetera, et cetera. And so therefore, the damages were limited to the cost of hiring a competent consultant to redraw the CAD drawings. Um, and, and so I guess Force India, uh, which was subsequently renamed to Racing Point, learned their lesson quite well. Um, in 2020, uh, they were accused of, and they actually admitted copying the last season's champions Mercedes designs and aerodynamics. And, um, but they claimed that they did it from photographs and reverse engineering from uh, bits which they were able to buy in the open market. Um, but I think they still came last in the season in which they copied Mercedes. So maybe to do with the driver, not the car. Um, so going into category three type information. Um, so what is category three type information? Um, the court will assess four factors. And we've set it out on the slide. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's quite apparent and or self-apparent once you look at it. And the most important part is, in fact, the fourth, uh, the fourth question, which is the fourth factor, which is whether the information can be isolated from such other information, um, which the employee is free to use or disclose. Um, if it cannot be isolated, the court has to give, will, will give weight against such information being classified as a trade secret. Um, so this approach, by looking at the full character, characteristics first to recognize whether information is a trade secret or not um, means that even if information is carried in one's head and not deliberately memorized, it still can be subject to an implied term uh, restraining the use of after the end of employment. Um, and I, I did not, uh, I think it was mentioned in the slide just now, the Seeger and Copydex case, but I didn't uh, delve into detail on that. But in that case, the facts were that uh, the employees had inadvertently and unconsciously used the information that was a trade secret at their new employers. Uh, and so the principles um, here are consistent with the older case law, uh, which didn't really mention um, or, or, or identify whether or not trade what are the characteristics of trade secrets. Um, now, moving on to slide, uh, the next slide, which is um, the case, or the, the, it's a very, very important case called Vestergaard, Frensen, and Bestnet Europe. Um, may, maybe we can first go to slide 15, which talks about the facts, which sets out the facts so people can follow better. Um, the facts in Vestergaard basically revolved around a group of employees who left Vestergaard to start their own firm to make mosquito nets and uh, which are soaked in insecticide. Um, there was one who is referred to throughout all the judgments as Mrs. Sig, and she was a marketing sales manager. The other colleague was a lab scientist, and the third was another uh, scientist and researcher who was a consultant of Vestergaard. Um, and so after the three started a new company, um, they, the scientists, uh, not uh, Mrs. Sig, the scientists, decided to use the formula of Vestergaard to sell the first generation mosquito nets. And then they subsequently developed the second generation with their own input and inventive step um, to uh, derive a new formula that was slightly more effective. Um, and then on the facts of the case, uh, as you can see from the slide, um, in fact, what uh, G, Mrs. Sig, was a shareholder and director of the new company. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, she won through all the way to the Supreme Court on her defense of no knowledge. Basically, she said that she did not receive any information uh, as an employee 
uh, when she was working for Vestigard because she was just sales and marketing and she was not on the technical side. So she had no access to the scientific information. Um, she was also not aware that her business partners had uh, used such trade secrets and technical information. And there was also no evidence before the court to suggest that she willfully turned a blind eye to the deception of her partners. Um, so while the Supreme Court and, in fact, all the judges held that she had behaved quite badly in setting up the competitor, in regard to the breach of confidence, she was not liable um, as her conscience remained unaffected throughout. So um, that going back to slide 14, um, so first point, this was the first case in which the court uh, confirmed that the action in breach of confidence an, an action in breach of confidence is based on uh, conscience. And in order for the conscience to be affected, a recipient must have known or agreed to such information being confidential. Um, and this has, in fact, been cited in the Shenzhen Fu Tai Hang Precision Industry case in Hong Kong. Um, but it, has not, it was not considered. Um, so going, coming back to Vestergaard, um, the Supreme Court specifically held that the court will not imply a term for an employment contract to the extent that the employee would not unknowingly assist another person to abuse a trade secret owned by the employer after the employee has left employment, um, as this went way beyond the requirements of equity. So um, in the judgment, which is quite, uh, I would commend you to read it, it the, the Supreme Court also provided examples in which a finding that uh, situations where the conscious may be affected. So we've set out in the slides um, the classic case, which involves uh, the cocoa test. Um, it was used inconsistently. Um, it's confidential by a person who received it, knowing that it was confidential. Um, and then there's also the subsequent knowledge where a person who may initially not have known that it was confidential subsequently came to know that it was confidential. And then at that point in time, the confidentiality would bite. Um, in relation to uh, employees who have left employment, this may then arise as a tort rather than a principle of equity arising from contra uh, con a contract with equity imposed on it. Um, in terms of willful blindness, um, that, that's also another example in which a uh, commercially unacceptable conduct by a employee, um, but obviously it's very, very fact sensitive um, as to whether or not someone was reckless as to whether they should or should not have uh, known that was uh, confidential information. So um, that takes me to the next case. Uh, this is a, actually a very, very recent case um, from the English Court of Appeal. The facts are actually very common uh, in day-to-day -day business. Um, the business in, uh, concerned was about travel agents, and the employee there uh, took his client list, basically, and used his client list, which he served for many years, at his new uh, company, where I think he was a shareholder. Um, however, he did not impress upon his, uh, new, uh, the new employees that the client list was actually taken from a confidential source or that the, the, the information was confidential. Um, the new employers tried to run a Vestigard type defense, saying that they did not know or have noticed that the information was confidential. Um, the English Court of Appeal rejected that approach, and I've set out the, uh, cite the, the quotation from uh, Lord Justice Arnold on the slide, um, that basically the test for conscience was an objective test. And so, in other words, the onus is on the person who is using that information derived from a third party to make such reasonable inquiries as to their origin and nature. And if they fail to do so, then their conscience, will, their conscience will be affected so as to attach some form of equitable obligation on the part of the uh, 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 recipient of that information. So pa pa pausing there, um, it seems as though that the, 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 the test of Vestergaard has shifted slightly now to also sort of put some burden or some 
requirement on the person receiving information that objectively may be confidential to actually make an inquiry. And so this leads to um, quite an exciting development, I would say, uh, if you are a breach of confidence junkie, um, <laughs> from Singapore. Um, <coughs> and in, this is the case of iAdmin Singapore. Uh, and it basically took the uh, COCO test and modified it um, on the basis that the law of confidence is underpinned uh, by equity and the focus is on the defendant's conscience. Surprisingly, the Court of Appeal did not actually cite Vestergaard, but it came to the same conclusion uh, that uh, breach of confidence in employment cases uh, is uh, founded upon uh, the defendant's conscience. So. Um, just running through the facts very quickly, it was a payroll and human resources uh, company. iAdmin was in that business. And the defendants were programmers. Uh, and they then uh, developers of the software which iAdmin used and sold to uh, other companies. And so the defendants basically, uh, while they were in employment, they started programming a new system. And then they, when they finished, they set up a new company. Um, what happened was that the plaintiff subsequently discovered, so this was uh, months after any form of interlocutory application could, take, could, could reasonably take place. Um, th they discovered the UI was very, very similar to their UI, and they, so they, they believed that uh, there was some copying of code. So they took out some search orders, um, and they discovered that, in fact, uh, the defendants did take confidential information of the company uh, in terms of the code, et cetera, et cetera. But they also found out that they did not use the same coding base. So this was a, a very strange case where the employees in question had taken the code and the information and the documents, but it was clear that they had not used that information. And so um, under the three-stage uh, COCO test, it's clear that the uh, employees would not be found liable for breach of confidence because there was no unauthorized use. And so this was, in fact, what happened at the High Court in Singapore. And on appeal, the Court of Appeal then decided that, well, it's too restrictive. The COCO test um, does not catch situations where, um, notwithstanding the fact that the code has been taken, uh, the focus was really only um, all on prevention of wrongful gain. Um, and so the, the Court of Appeal basically went through uh, hundreds of years, well, uh, decades of case law in relation to why there was a breach of confidence. And they identified that the breach of confidence actually protected two forms of interest. One, as I mentioned, was to prevent wrongful gain from unauthorized use. And the second one was to prevent wrongful loss suffered by the owner of the confidential information uh, when it had been taken away. And they then held that um, the COCO test was insufficient to protect the second limb, which was to prevent wrongful loss. Um, they also made a very uh, pertinent observation as to why they felt that they needed to modify the COCO test. Um, they observed that in the digital information age, you know, when we're talking about uh, information all being uh, digital, very easily transferred. Um, the COCO test did not protect sufficiently the taking away of uh, the, the information in the first place. And so um, it skewed the test, the, the test skewed cases to basically only uh, those in which uh, the employer could prove wrongful use or unauthorized use. And so um, they then, in effect, uh, applied the test. And the test uh, has a very interesting concept of shifting of the burden. Um, and so what, what happens is, as you can see from the slide, I've underlined in red what is different from the COCO test. And in effect, what it is is a shifting of the burden, evidential burden, onto the uh, user or recipient or the, whole, or, or the defendant. Um, once they've taken the information, they have to prove that they did not know that information was confidential. 
And so what this means in practical terms for employers is that it's much easier, at least in terms of liability, to establish a case against an employee um, who, who, who takes information away. And as you know, a lot of lawyers know, uh, people working in firms, in banks, etc., uh, a lot of employees like to hold on to what they've done before as a sort of knowledge database so that they can uh, use it as part of their uh, uh, knowledge going forward. They may not necessarily be abusing such information, but they may wish to refer to templates, etc., from time to time. So it may seem as though that the law has extended to actually prohibit this type of activity. So um, th this is quite welcoming from the employer's perspective. Uh, and for the employee's perspective, this adds another layer of difficulties if one is caught uh, copying materials from the employer. Just to put you on the spot here, I, and I, I agree that employees often take huge quantities of documentation away with them. Um, I usually think that they take it as a crutch because they're just fearful that they don't have access to that template or the previous drafting, especially lawyers when they move from firm to firm. And the reality is they go into a new firm, they've got new templates and new everything else and they use these things and, and it, it's a crutch that they never actually use it. They just take it with them as, as you say, a safety net. Uh, but the question is, and I can't remember when VersGuard was decided, but um, it was a fair while before the two recent cases that you mentioned. Do you think VersGuard would be decided differently if they applied um, the travel counsellors and the Singapore case that we've just mentioned? Um, well, I think... Uh, that's, that's a, Sorry that's, to put you on the spot. No, no, that's a very interesting question. I think, f firstly, um, just to answer your question on VersGuard, um, on one hand, you can say that uh, there was still no knowledge. Uh, the High Court judge, in fact, made a finding that there was no knowledge on the part of Mrs. Sig, and therefore it's possible that she could have displaced the presumption um, which was put onto her. But on the other hand, um, this shifting of the burden or the creating of the presumption um, would actually require, on an evidential basis, Mrs. Sig to be more forthcoming about her knowledge. And I think I recall from um, reading the High Court judgment some time ago, uh, there was actually a specific finding by the judge that um, although he accepted the evidence of uh, Mrs. Sig, uh, he also believed, he, he made a quip, he believed that she knew more than meets the eye, yes. something along the lines of that. And so I think um, had the pre, it, I think in terms of the preparation of trial witness statements, interrogatories, uh, all that pretrial procedure may have then exposed Mrs. Sig to more of a burden and she would have been advised that she, in fact she needs to give more evidence as to what she knew about the technical side. Okay. And so that may have then led to a different result. And so these cases would essentially move the line a little bit more in favor of the employer exposing what she called Mrs. Sig to slightly more risk on this side of things and, and increase the burden. I, I suppose one of the questions, just preempting what people might ask, um, this case which modifies the COCO test is from the Singapore Court of Appeal. Yes. Um, just generally, uh, would the Hong Kong courts have regard to this? Well, I think in terms of commercial case laws, Singapore has always been regarded quite highly by the judges in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, and so uh, bearing in mind that Vestergaard uh, has been cited uh, in Hong Kong by the Court of Appeal, and uh, notwithstanding this case not citing Vestergaard, they both arrive at the same point in terms of conscience being the, conscience being the underpinning uh, principle in uh, breach of confidence. I, I think there might be a, a good likelihood of the modified test being applied. But even if it's not applied um, expressly, one can look at uh, the travel case, uh, where you can see that the Court of Appeal was, in fact, uh, putting the um, put, so, you, so, sort of putting a burden on the recipient to actually show that the recipient uh, of the, the, the employee. Of the, in the well, no, in, 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 in travelers, it was the it was the new employers who were sued. Sorry, yes, yeah. but the the the, the, the yes, recipient not the recipient of the confidential information. Yes. Yeah. So, so while they may not be able to catch the employee in question under the Vestergaard Travelers scenario, um, the new employers would be liable for uh, misuse of confidential information if they didn't make reasonable okay. inquiries. I know you're doing vicarious liability, so 
<laughs> I won't step on your toes. Well, now I don't have to cover my <laughs> okay. Um Well, turning on to the next slide and area, in fact, which is uh, fiduciary duty and duty of fidelity. Um, often, um, they are used interchangeably because obviously the recognized heads overlap. But it's important to note that, they, uh, that this is wrong in principle. Um, the, the main difference is that for the duty of fidelity or good faith, as quite often referred to as now, an employee is entitled to look out for their own interests, whereas the, uh, the, touch, the, the touchstone for fiduciary is that they uh, have a single-minded, exclusive loyalty to the employer in question. Um, but it is also important to note that a fiduciary duty cannot be implied to the extent that it contradicts any express terms of a contract um, on, on the simple and trite principle that you cannot override uh, express terms of a contract by equity. And so um, the two cases I've cited here, uh, Helmut Integrated and University of Nottingham, they've not been um, relied upon as uh, cases or case law or authority establishing fiduciary duties for employees in Hong Kong, but they were cited in this uh, 2013 case of Noble Spirit, um, which was asking the question as to whether or not a fiduciary duty arose as a matter of tort or as a matter of contract for the question of uh, whether or not uh, this type of uh, claim can be determined by a the Labour Tribunal, or it must, or it is excluded from the Labour tri Tribunal's ju jurisdiction under Section Seven of the uh, LTO. Um, so I, I would say, however, nonetheless, um, that body of case law in the UK is so well established now, uh, and a lot of the company law cases in Hong Kong uh, rely on the same authorities to establish fiduciary duties for directors. I would say that it would be quite uh, applicable to Hong Kong. Um, in terms of uh, factors of establishing um, fiduciary duties, um, we've we set out in this list uh, the, the main factors which the courts will look for. Obviously, it's non-exhaustive. And in the case of um, Richard Baker Harrison, which I've cited, uh, it was a manager. Uh, a manager who worked for many years but was just a manager and not in the top tier of uh, decision making, not sitting on the board, not sitting, uh, uh, not having the, the power to hire and fire around him. Um, so, but on the facts of that case, they did hold that Richard, uh, the, the, the employee in question was a fiduciary. And so they focused on the last aspect, which was the special role or status conferred on the employee. And so in that case, uh, he was in charge of suppliers and the supply chain. He had 30 years experience and, he, and, and the company relied on um, all his connections with the suppliers to do business. And so um, in that compartmentalized regard, he owed fiduciary duties not to make certain representations about his employer, which he did. Uh, and therefore, the court found that he was in breach of that specific fiduciary duty. Um, Sorry, just, just looking at that slide. Um, obviously, with directors and the like, they are, are fiduciaries. But for non-director fiduciaries, um, essentially, we need to take... Sorry, just to click back to the slide. We need to take a holistic view as to what the person is. And so a very high remuneration doesn't necessarily mean that we cross the line into fiduciary. Um, similarly, somebody with sort of heavy responsibility doesn't necessarily mean to cross the line into fiduciary. It's a, it's a sort of totality test um, yes. that so, we so, need to come to. Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, if someone is called director of special ops, for example, um, that the word director itself is quite meaningless in the absence of job scope responsibilities. Uh, well, everyone decision. in a bank is an executive <laughs> director or vice president or something at some stage. And so grand sounding titles, but exactly. you know, vice president's you know, one of the lowest <laughs> titles. Um, yeah. OK, so um, turning on to the next slide, which is the scopes of duties under fiduciary and fidelity. Um, you'll note, uh, I've set out a list here, but obviously that's non-exhaustive. Um, so for under fidelity, the courts have recognized these headings uh, as 
part of the duty of good faith and fidelity. Um, for those of you who are a little bit more eagle-eyed, you'll note that I've put specific, I've excluded specifically the duty, uh, no duty to report your own wrongdoing um, under this, because simply this is this is this is for uh, heads that fall under both fidelity and fiduciary. Um, so mo moving on to the next slide, disclosure of emerging uh, commercial threats. So I think Adam mentioned just now at the beginning in the introduction about team moves or desk moves and poaching of key persons. Um, it's quite established now uh, that the duty of fidelity does require some employees in certain situations to report uh, emerging commercial threats. Um, but obviously, it's all fact sensitive, and it really depends on again, the seniority, the responsibility, the importance of the person to the company, as well as the, uh, the, the detriment that may be suffered by the company if the employer, if they have not received uh, forward notice of it. Um, so the, I, I cited the case of Imam, and it's quite interesting um, because the wrong actually occurred during garden leave. So a lot of employees will think, oh, I'm in garden leave. I've got no access to the company's computers. I can do anything I want. Um, in that case, he was a senior employee. Uh, and like a lot of, uh, I think, bankers and those working in the finance industry, he had in his contract vesting options, uh, a, a clauses that would allow him to vest shares uh, after certain years of service, etc. Um, there was also a clause there uh, called a good lever, which essentially said that if you depart on good terms and you don't breach your contractual uh, obligations against the employer, you will uh, there will be no callback or there will be you 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 will get your vested shares in the company, etc. Um, what happened was he was approached uh, to start up a new company uh, when that was that would have been in competition with his uh, employer. Um, and he took preparatory steps. So he didn't join it immediately. He did some work for uh, preparatory steps to assist. Um, and then after his restrictive covenants, everything expired. He then joined the new company. Um, the court actually found uh, that during the garden leave period, he still had a duty of fidelity. And it was that very negative obligation that he should not have done any preparatory steps, and he should not, and he should have informed his employer about it. That when uh, that that he was in fact material breach of his contractual terms, when he was uh, still an existing employee, notwithstanding the fact that he was on garden leave, and the result of that case was he lost 1.7 million pounds in shares that ought to have vested in him. So. Um, both employers and employees, please be aware that garden leave is not a ticket, a golden ticket to do as you please. Uh, also, with regard to that, <clears throat> yes, you're, you're still an employee during garden leave, you know, behave. Um, but also, um, having some form of deferred compensation, hang risk hanging over employees, is an excellent way for employers to keep employees in line. Uh, there's one thing that, you know, if there wasn't any deferred compensation, would the employer really have taken any action against the employee to seek damages or an injunction because the period of time would be so short, etc.? Um, probably not, because the, the cost-effort benefit wouldn't work out. But if you've got, you know, you're, you're holding the check, some deferred compensation, and all you have to do is just cancel it, um, it's a very powerful tool that employers have against employees um, to, to keep them in line. Yeah. Um so going back to the slides on the disclosure of commercial threats, just now I was talking about the duty of fidelity. So now I'll move on to fiduciary. Um, the answer, although fidu a fiduciary has a, owes a more onerous burden to the employer, the answer is still maybe. And, and, and this is because specifically in the um, item software case in 2004 where the, uh, the the, the English Court of Appeal there, when it uh, came up with the test for uh, fiduciary duties of directors and employees with direct uh, with fiduciary-like uh, obligations, um, the, the Court of Appeal held that the test was 
prescriptive in a sense that um, it is not a single recognized head of duty to do something or not to do something, but a good faith requirement. And it was a subjective requirement in the sense that the director had, uh, the court had to assess whether it was the, the, the director subjectively and honestly believed that not disclosing or disclosing was in the best interest of the company. Um, and so this was applied subsequently in the GHLM trading case um, as the status of Fasihi when it was first uh, handed down was still quite controversial. But uh, it seems as though it is now good law and the GHLM trading case uh, by the English High Court confirmed that this is, he was bound by the, uh, the case law and he, he, he then applied it. And um, recently, well, relatively recently, the Court of Appeal was asked to consider whether or not the principles in Fasihi and GHLM were applicable. Um, but uh, because it was only brought on during the appeal stage and not during the Court of First Instance stage, uh, applying the flywind principles, the Court of Appeal said, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it another day. And so in Hong Kong, it seems as though um, there is an opening somewhere for uh, enterprising team of lawyers to try to bring this point of disclosing uh, emerging commercial threats on a basis of a fiduciary duty to apply in Hong Kong. Um, and I think, um, Adam, isn't there a sort of case that sort of goes directly against this in terms of express terms? Um, to disclose... To disclose wrongdoing. wrongdoing or dis uh, yeah. Your own wrongdoing. <laughs> Your own wrongdoing. Uh, yes, I think it's essentially uh, the express term in the Boyer case. Um, in Boyer, there was a term of the contract which said something along the lines of, um, if you're approached um, for, to take up employment, or if you're, you, know, you anticipate taking up employment, or it's essentially if you're looking to move, uh, I think the clause also said, said to a competitor rather than just generally, uh, then you've got to disclose that um, to the employer, Cantor Fitzgerald in that case. And that was a very small part of a, a much bigger judgment. But the judge essentially said, in that case, sort of not dealing with the question, the organization that Boyer and um, the other uh, individuals moved to wasn't a competitor. It was, it was a startup. And so in no way could it be said to be a competitor of Cantor. Uh, but I think more interestingly, what he says underneath that is, you know, putting all of that to a side, if I was to be asked to enforce a clause like this, um, what remedy could I offer? Employees are, are free to, to seek out other employment. Employees are free to talk to other people and you know, explore the market and see what else is there. Um, and it's not reasonable um, to expect all employees to sort of put their hand up and say, by the way, I'm going for an interview with your competitor to see if they're going to offer me more money or a better job. And so um, what, what practical remedy could the court actually give to enforce such a contractual term, um, even if it is an express term? And it, it does apply to the facts. Yeah. And so in a way, yes, it's potentially enforceable. But what will the court do with it? What remedy is the employer actually looking for? And so um, it, I think the Boyer case, the way that it dealt with it, sort of neutralized such an express term as um, not really obliging an employee to disclose when they're sort of exploring opportunities. Yeah. Um, I think going to what you were saying, though, is if you know, if I was a director and my team was obviously talking to other people, I should, as a fiduciary, I should put my hand up and, and draw someone's attention to that. Um, and certainly there is the, the question that we always get asked, which is, you know, from the moment I accept the offer, when do I need to tell my employer? And if you're a senior management of fiduciary, then you need to tell your employer pretty quickly because essentially you're sort of riding two horses and you're not allowed to do that. And so, um, yes, if you accept a job, then you should resign pretty quickly afterwards. Um, that being said, um, it's not always practical because if you're such a senior person, you're probably going to spend a month or so negotiating contract terms. And so, you know, you're almost 100% leaving, but you're just signing off on sort of final terms. Um, when, do you, when do you tell your employer? Um, it's a bit of a balancing act. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think. Coming back to the fiduciary question and whether or not Boyer would preclude the sort of court from implying uh, this type of term, um, I, I recall that I think it was Mr. Justice Reyes. I don't mm -hmm. think he was cited for Sihi. Uh, I don't think he considered no, um, 
whether or not the fiduciary duties in question could have that prescriptive effect to, to, to assist with the express terms as well, to, to assist in the construction of the express terms. So I think personally, it's still a question that is wide open. And I think a, a more modern court may actually uh, want to revisit that issue as to whether or not such express terms can be, can be had. And albeit maybe the scope of it might have to change for it to be, to, to obviously take into account of um, you know, things like ba the, bi the Bill of Rights and basic law rights, freedom of uh, occupation. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if a case like that would readily crop up because if someone's going to write an employment contract which has got a well-worded clause of um, an express term of essentially disclosing that wrongdoing, that contract's probably going to have in it fairly comprehensive confidentiality and other non-compete restrictions. And if you're going to court to enforce, you know, th that express clause we're talking about would be fourth or fifth on the list of things that you're yeah. seeking judgment of. And I think that was pretty much the same in Boyer. You know, that was you know, a periphery issue against the, the non-compete and everything else. And, and that's where the focus would be um, if you're going to fight a case like this. But then again, if, if this is all you've got, um, then, yep, you need to stretch it and make it work for you as much as you can. Okay, um, th thanks for that, Anne. Going to own wrongdoing, um, for, the, for, 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 for the duty of fidelity, obviously this is very well established by now, um, that there is no duty uh, if for an employee to disclose their own wrongdoing. Um, however, there is actually a very interesting case, albeit, again, it's on a relatively uh, lower court level. Uh, this is the Humankind charity case on the slide. Um, and it's from an Employment Appeals Tribunal case in 2019 of the UK. Uh, the facts of that case was that a charity manager racked up about £8,000 of spending on an app store uh, on her iPad. Um, then, but the iPad didn't belong to her, it was the charities, and uh, she was then tasked to investigate who was using the iPad at that material time. And she came up with the investigation report herself, and she said, after uh, investigation, uh, we cannot pin it down on any single person. Um, but she did the right thing and she resigned for the reason that it happened on her watch. Um, but obviously the employer had its own suspicions and it conducted further investigations. And during the course of those further investigations, they found out that the manager in fact was in possession of the iPad at all the material times. And so the only person that could have racked up that expense was her and she was uh, dismissed as a result. The uh, employment tribunal uh, held initially that there was no express term in, according to the, the case law to require her to disclose her own wrongdoing as she was not in a position as a fiduciary. Um, on appeal, um, the, um, the appeals tribunal basically held that there was a different it distinguished a situation between where an employee who remained silent about their misconduct was entitled to do so to an employee who uh, basically was dishonest and lied to the employer. And so therefore, um, although the duty of fidelity did not, uh, could not attach itself to a employee who keeps silent, um, when the employee positively misleads the employer, then the duty of fidelity and good faith kicks in. So uh, in, in that sense, um, the, there is a caveat, or, or at least an emerging caveat now, in relation to whether or not a person has a duty to disclose wrongdoing under the duty of fidelity. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot. I don't really know this case. What was the employer actually suing her for? Or was she suing the employer and then the, the case is reversed on appeal? Um, was she going for unfair dismissal or something? Yes, she was going for unfair dismissal because uh, she said that you can't dismiss me for um, my own wrongdoing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so obviously the case is the other way around because the UK could have appealed. I understand that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, accessory liability, I'm, I'm not really going to touch upon this uh, in any detail. Uh, but the, it is very useful, again, for um, employers in team moves, um, uh, simply because uh, when, one, when, when a team moves, it could be in dribs and drabs, or it could be all in one go. And sometimes you're not able to actually get the employee in question, um, but you may be able to uh, try to get accessory liability, the new employers, for example. 
And so we've listed out in the slides um, some common causes of action, uh, dishonest assistance, and, um, and obviously one of the reasons why fiduciary duties and is so important in the armory against uh, employees who, who, who do wrongdoing against their former employers is because if there is a breach of fiduciary duty, you can attach the same uh, to uh, the employer by way of, the new employer by way of dishonest assistance, and you can have equi equitable remedies of tracing and trust uh, on profits, etc. Um, the others include inducement of breaches of contract, uh, that's a tortious remedy, um, and also conspiracy to injure. And uh, I just wish to point out that it's quite rare for conspiracy to injure by lawful means in team move type cases. Usually you'll find um, it's a breach of contract, breach of confidence type situation, which is already sufficient to turn uh, the means to be unlawful. And then finally, uh, vicarious liability as the traveler case um, uh, highlighted that the, notwithstanding the fact that the employee in question uh, cannot be held liable for misusing uh, confidential information, uh, the employer of that employee may, in fact, be held to be vicariously liable for that. Just, just looking at accessory liability, um, we're going to come on to remedies at the end, but we don't really go into them in any detail, so I don't mind mentioning it now. Um, for springboard injunctions, and so uh, they tend to be typically connect to breach of contract and breach of confidence. And so an employee walks out with a pile of papers belonging to an employer um, and gets a competitive advantage, then you can seek what's called a springboard injunction, which essentially is the person sits out uh, whilst they neutralize the, the positive effect they gave to the new employer. Um, the case of uh, McLaren's and various individuals and Charles Taylor, which was a case I was involved with about two years ago, um, the Hong Kong courts recognized that springboard injunctions can also attach to a breach of fiduciary duty. Um, it's a concept that existed in the UK for a while, but I think that's the first case in Hong Kong where they've also allowed springboard remedies to be something that's associated with breach of fiduciary duty as well as breach of confidence. Thank you. Yep. So um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Adam for express terms and PTRs. Okay, thank you. Um, at the very beginning, I did talk about uh, confidentiality as being expressed term of the contract. Um, we don't have a lot of time. I think Earl's really covered a lot of confidentiality anyway. Um, what we would advise, of course, is that since um, not all categories of confidence, um, and Earl was referring to category two in his presentation, would be protected post-termination, then certainly it's imperative that an employer would include a sort of well-drafted confidentiality clause, uh, which is stated to apply post-termination in the employment contract. Um, I think going into drafting of confidentiality clause is a bit dry, so I propose to sort of park that there and focus more on post-termination restrictions. Uh, sorry, yep, on the slides we've got the um, most common post-termination restrictions, and usually the sort of uh, the main restriction, the most onerous restriction, is the non-compete restriction, which essentially prevents an employee from working for a competitor for a certain period of time. And we'll probably focus on that the most because that's the one that exercises employers, employees, and new employers the most. Um, the next would be slightly out of order, but the non-solicitation of customers and clients. And then coupled with that, the non-dealing with customers and clients. Um, it's very typical to still see um, clauses drafted that only refer to non-solicitation or non-interference or inducement or enticement of clients without also including a clause which says non-dealing. The concept um, is probably more complicated than I'm going to explain it, but non-solicitation essentially means that the employee cannot go out to a, a client that they dealt with with their previous employer and say, hi, let's meet for a coffee, let's discuss what I can do with my new job, um, you know, sending brochures, sort of soliciting, trying to induce the person in. We're in a very connected world. Everybody's online. As soon as you update your LinkedIn profile, everyone that you've ever spoken to is going to see your LinkedIn profile, see you've moved to a competitor. And so quite often clients would reach out to you without requiring any inducement or enticement. And if you don't have a non-dealing clause, 
um, query to what extent a non-solicitation would protect um, the former employer. If a client phoned me up and said, hi, I see you've just moved to a new organization, let's meet for a coffee. So all of the driving force comes from the client and not from the individual. Um, that probably isn't solicitation. And so in order to protect essentially on both sides, um, it's important that you include non-dealing. Um, then we just going back up the slides, non-solicitation of employees. Um, and obviously that's intended to protect and maintain a stable workforce. Um, that people don't want you to, to sort of move to a new employer and then go back and try and sort of poach your team to join you. Uh, and then quite often we see non-interference with supplies. Um, personally, I've never been involved in any case where um, we've needed to sort of seek to restrict somebody or sue somebody because they've interfered with suppliers. Um, but you, it's a fairly typical clause in employment contracts. Um, other clauses that we see that I've not put on the slide would be clauses which essentially um, seek to prevent people from uh, one organization joining another organization in tandem, not necessarily as part of a team move, uh, but if somebody else has moved there, you cannot move there within a period of three months, or you cannot set up in partnership, um, sometimes referred to as sort of non-association or non-partnership restrictions. Um, and also, sort of literally on my desk at the moment, is a restriction we're advising on, which is a restriction that seeks to prevent um, somebody from moving in-house with one of their clients. Now, looking at this from a, a lawyer's perspective, and I know we've got a lot of lawyers um, viewing, law firms tend to be quite happy when one of their staff moves into a client because it sort of really uh, firms up and concretes that uh, sort of solicitor-client relationship. Uh, this particular case is more of sort of agency um, uh, situation where once the person's moved into the clients, then the need to use the agency is going to diminish, and so obviously they want to prevent that from happening. Okay. The starting point for all restrictions is that they're unenforceable unless they're enforceable. And in order for a restriction to be enforceable, it has to be um, reasonable and it has to seek to protect legitimate business interests. Um, and then beyond that, it needs to go no further than is absolutely necessary to protect those legitimate business interests. Just pausing on no further than is absolutely necessary to look at the business interests, uh, we need to look at that both in terms of individual restrictions and then the sort of the whole suite of post-termination restrictions in the contract together. And so um, duration, which we're going to look at soon, um, is an obvious uh, uh, example of where a restriction can go beyond what's reasonably necessary. If, if you don't need to restrict someone for more than three months, it would be unreasonable to impose a 12-month restriction. Looking at all of the terms together, um, as we say, a non-compete restriction is incredibly onerous. And so an employer has to take a view of, can the same legitimate business interests be protected with a less onerous restriction? So for example, if you put in place non-solicitation and non-dealing with customers or clients, is that enough to give protection to the previous employer? Or do they have to go for the sort of more nuclear option of the non-compete? Um, and obviously, these things are very fact specific. Um, but quite often, what is said is, we cannot police a non-solicitation clause. Once the employee has moved from us and they're working for the new employer, we don't know what they're doing. We don't know who they're talking to, et cetera. And so if it's genuinely impossible to police, then you can justify a non-compete restriction when perhaps, arguably, a non-solicitation, non-dealing restriction would work. Um, at the bottom of the slide, I mention um, conduct of the employee. Um, and this is really um, sort of stretching out a little bit from the Iman case that Earl referred to. Um, with this case, uh, what I'm thinking of is the Hong Kong case of Pure International, Pure, the, the gym that's throughout town. Um, there was a case in 2013 where a personal trainer left Pure, uh, gave notice, uh, I think three months notice, to leave Pure and to go uh, to a competitor. And the trainer had in his contract a restriction that says you should not work within, I think, 1,000 meters of the last gym that you worked with um, for six months post-termination. And I think the personal trainer was essentially going from one gym, the pure gym, to a, a rival gym next door, so certainly within the 1,000 meters. Um, and the court was asked to determine whether that was a reasonable restriction um, that he cannot work within that, uh, within that geography. Um, there are a few reasons that the judge came to to say, yes, it was perfectly fair. Well, you know, 1,000 meters isn't far. 
There are plenty of opportunities to work elsewhere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what the employee did that was particularly naughty, um, and it, it sort of ties back into the Iman case, is during his notice period, he started doing promotional, I think, YouTube videos for the new gym. Um, and so a little bit like Iman, he was in his notice period, he was still owed all of his duties to Pure. There would be express duties of, of sort of uh, you know, fidelity, um, you know, uh, acting in the best interest of Pure, etc. And he wasn't. He was, he was working um, in the interest of his new employer. And in that case, um, Justice Seagroat um, basically said, even if I'm wrong um, in enforcing the six-month post-termination restriction over 1,000 um, meters from the gym, I'm satisfied I've made the right decision because you um, decided to essentially breach your express duties whilst you were still employed by essentially gearing up to compete or promoting your new employer. And so... Um, when assessing reasonableness, to a certain extent, um, what the employee did as they were leaving their previous employer uh, will have some impact on it. If the employee is very open and honest, that's one thing. If the employee is doing wrongdoing, then essentially that's going to be on the, the weighing scales against them. Okay. So as I mentioned, when assessing reasonableness, um, there are a number of things that the court looks at, and there's the list there, duration, geography, scope of business drafting and ambiguity, possibly scope of business drafting and ambiguity all sort of hang together, financial compensation. And then we're going to look at the blue pencil test or the blue pencil doctrine, and when is reasonableness assessed? And all of these then tie together to a uh, recent case that we're going to discuss. And so for duration. Um, Quite often, um, this is the, the key thing that everybody focuses on when looking at post-termination restrictions. Certainly when they arrive on my desk, either from a, po a former employer, an employee, or a new employer that's looking to hire somebody with restrictions, the only question or the only issue that they focus on is duration. And a lot of employees, and to that extent employers, tend to sort of operate on quite broad sort of rules of thumb as to what duration is reasonable and what's not. And so employees tend to start with the position of, well, it can't be enforceable, they're not paying me for this, and so they can't enforce it. Um, and Hong Kong's a very international market, and there are plenty of jurisdictions in the world where you must pay um, at least a proportion of wages in order for the non-compete to be enforceable. So uh, continental Europe, typically there has to be a payment. And so when they see contracts in Hong Kong where there's no payment, even if the restrictions for quite a short period of time, sort of three months, they just say, this can't be enforceable against me. And, and obviously that's wrong. Um, sometimes employers look at this or employees look at this and they see that 12 months is in there and they go, well, 12 months can't be reasonable. It, it's far too long. Um, so that, that can't be enforceable. Again, not necessarily true. Um, and then the, the sticking point really for everybody and when as a solicitor we're called to make a call on whether something's reasonable or not, um, the sort of super grey area, the difficult one to answer tends to be the six months um, non-compete restriction or the six months uh, non-solicit non-dealing. Um, I say six months tends to be a problem because 12 months can be enforceable but it is a very high hurdle. Three months isn't necessarily always enforceable. It has to be the right employee, and it still has to seek to protect legitimate business interests. But generally, with a three-month restriction, employees and future employers can sort of work through it um, when onboarding employees. It, it's something that can be managed um, uh, in terms of timing. Um, and so they can sort of adhere to it, even if um, we would quibble whether it's enforceable or not. Whereas six months is always too long to manage, and so the, uh, the client always tries to push you to say that that's not reasonable. As I say, it's, it's not as straightforward as just applying sort of simple rules of thumb. The more senior you are, the longer the restriction. The more you're paid, the longer restriction, etc. Um, it's a much more nuanced test. Um, and so we need to look at the legitimate business factors that the employee is trying to protect. Um, and when we look at the slide, um, it essentially says that it's not a matter of how long the employee could be expected to have the competitive edge, but rather how long it takes for the employer to be able to um, bolster its business, hire new people into the role, solidify those client relationships. Um, and there's a bit of a distinction um, 
between employers where you've got a sort of uh, a key salesperson who is has all of the client relationships, has built those relationships over time, and is the main person that's dealing with everybody, versus say a huge sales team um, where they're dealing with sort of ingrained clients belonging to the employer. The um, the customers are signed up to long term contracts. There's not really a lot of room for them to wriggle out. Um, it's it's more difficult to enforce a restriction against them because what legitimate interests are they trying to protect? You know, the, the clients are already well bedded within the company. The contracts are there. The risk of those clients moving is quite low. Whereas if somebody's got that sort of unique relationship, the risk of those clients jumping ship um, is proportionately quite high. And again, in sales roles, it's not necessarily the most senior person in the organization. Um, key account managers with customers' clients um, tend to be the ones that are the greatest threat because they have those core relationships. When a court determines um, what's reasonable, essentially it's a matter of impression and common sense for the judge. Uh, what judges tend not to like is um, witnesses going into court and essentially saying, in my opinion, this is a fair period of time. The court wants you to present to it um, factual evidence as to what your legitimate business interest is and why it needs to be protected and what protection you need to shore that up. And you can't go into a court with the sort of various bare assertions. They, they just don't accept it. You know, it's confidential. He has a lot of confidential information. It's not good enough. You really have to drill down and provide a lot of detail and information as to the business and what the employee does and the risk that they need. And then the judge makes the assessment as to uh, what's reasonable and what's not. Uh, this being said, um, there are some businesses where, where things are, are more obvious. Um, insurance is one of those key businesses uh, where it's much easier to say it's a cyclical business. Um, contracts are renewed on an annual basis and therefore 12 months is, is reasonable. That that's almost explains itself. Uh, whereas other businesses, you've got to be uh, much more detailed. Um, also, um, when you're arguing that a certain duration of restriction needs to be put in place to protect confidential information, what you really need to establish is what is the shelf life of that confidential information. Um, Earl mentioned at the very beginning that um, the three categories that he refers to, information tends to move between the three. So something's a trade secret one day, it's confidential information the next day, and it's in the public domain the day after. Um, what is the shelf life of that information you're seeking to protect? And a lot of the cases that we see tend to relate to financial services and um, the key data, information, et cetera, et cetera, in the financial services industry tends to be very fast moving. And so you know, what's confidential today, those strategies, investments, et cetera, et cetera, um, go out of date or become in the public domain very quickly. And so you need to be able to prove um, the, the duration that you need. And we'll talk about that at the end. Also within duration, there's a number of other sort of side considerations. The first is to look carefully at when the duration starts. Um, we refer to these as post-termination restrictions. But in Hong Kong, because of the unique way that employees can buy out their notice periods, it's not uncommon to see a post-termination restriction starting from the date that notice is given from either side. Um, even if you wouldn't necessarily enforce a non-compete restriction against somebody in day-to-day -day events because a non-solicitor or non-dealing would be good enough, it's quite typical to see a non-compete restriction put in place back-to-back -back with the notice period that runs for the same period as the notice but starts from when notice is given. And so what I mean by this is an employee who um, is subject to a three-month notice period can easily buy out that three-month notice period and go and work for a competitor the next day. If you put in place a three-month post-termination restriction, even if possibly that wouldn't be otherwise enforceable, but you ran that post-termination restriction from the date that notice is given, generally speaking, it would prevent the employee from buying out their notice period. Because why would they buy out their notice period if there's still a risk that they could be prevented from working for the same three months? Essentially, they lose twice. They buy out their notice period, and they don't earn during that notice period. If you're not going to run a post-termination restriction from the date that notice is given, um, it's important to take into consideration garden leave. Um, if your notice period is going to be more than a month, three months, six months, and you're going to include garden leave provisions, um, it's very usual and probably advisable that you include a set-off provision that says any time spent on garden leave will reduce the post-termination restriction. 
If you don't do that and you had a three month notice period and say a six month non-compete period and you put the employee on, um, on garden leave on day one, essentially what you're doing is keeping that person out of the market for nine months. And so when you come to enforce the post-termination restriction, the court's going to ask you, why do you need nine months protection? Because that's what you'd be getting by default rather than sort of the, the six months protection that the non-compete is. And so you've sort of increased the hurdle for yourself. And so it's worthwhile putting the set off in place. Uh, ever so often, uh, we see contracts, which I think are pretty typical in Australia, where they have a sort of cascading duration. And so, you know, you shall not for one month compete, you shall not for three months compete, you shall not for six months compete, you shall not for 12 months compete. And so the clause says them all. And essentially, um, they ask the court to decide what's reasonable. Um, I don't think that any um, sort of cascading restriction like that's ever been enforced in Hong Kong. No. Um, it, it's too ambiguous. No one knows what the non-compete period is. And so the court would strike that out as an enforceable. What I have seen, though, is a smart, clever um, way of sort of creating the same thing, which is a non-compete restriction, very well drafted, very, very tight, uh, for six months post-termination. And then a second document called a supplemental non-compete restriction for six months after the first non-compete restriction um, expires. And so essentially it creates a, a, a cumulative effect of a 12-month non-compete. But instead of saying 12 months in one contract, which if a court said that 12 months is too onerous and it's unenforceable, the whole thing falls away, uh, what essentially it's doing is it's allowing the court to say, well, 12 months is unenforceable, so the second contract falls away because it's void. But the first contract um, is still arguably valid, and so you get six months or 12 months. Um, I see those from time to time in Hong Kong. I'm not sure of any case law where a judge has looked at it to see if it is similar to the Australian cascading, but um, it's sort of a hybrid between the two. Um, the other um, key feature that everybody looks at uh, with post-termination restrictions is geography. Um, what is it trying to restrict over what region? Uh, they can be very localized, and we referred to the Pure case, where that was only uh, 1,000 meters. Um, I saw a contract recently which was um, 40 kilometers from Aberdeen radius, and you know when we got the map and drew 40 kilometers from Aberdeen, there's a tiny corner of Lantau that's not covered. Um, and so that essentially means a Hong Kong restriction. I don't know why they didn't write it as a Hong Kong restriction, but they didn't. Um, there are sort of country or region-wide restrictions, and so Hong Kong, continental-wide restrictions. Um, I think people need to be careful when they refer to continent-wide restrictions because it's often ambiguous where continents start and finish. Um, also, um, we see APAC a lot, and, and what does APAC actually mean? Um, is it sort of greater China all the way down to South Asia, all the way down to uh, Australia or not? I think it's much safer um, to actually name jurisdictions, uh, the key jurisdictions that you're seeking to protect against, and then put in a sweep-up clause or su such other jurisdiction as where you perform duties or something like that, rather than just saying within APAC, because it can be quite ambiguous. And then, of course, there are worldwide um, restrictions. Um, historically, sort of, you know, I, Earl mentioned that I took the mickey out of him for including 1895 cases. Historically, you know, a lot of these cases are 100 years old that we rely on, and worldwide restrictions are quite unusual. As the world's become more connected, people can do business from everywhere, competition can happen from anywhere, um, worldwide restrictions are being enforced much more readily, possibly, than they ever were. Um, I think just to add to Adam's point, if you really want to enforce on a regional level, um, to make things um, safer and more secure, you probably would want to uh, also specify the countries yeah. um, that you actually do have business in. Um, because if there comes a blue pencil test, which I think Adam will talk about yeah. later, then at least you can salvage uh, those parts of the uh, PTR rather than having the whole clause struck out. Uh, I indeed. Um, and it's better to include um, within reason more rather than less. Um, we often have a, a lot of um, debate when the, the clause refers to China or um, PRC and then nothing more um, in terms of to what extent is that mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan 
all of them, some of them, part of them. Um, and quite often when people do list out, Macau is forgotten. And more than once, um, my, my savvy corporate partner, Chris Hooley, has uh, plonked people in Macau for the first six months. And so they've been working very competitively, but not within the, um, the confines of the, the post-termination restriction. And so um, you just need to be, uh, just need to make sure you don't miss out anything which is key, um, because as I say, we can blue pencil it later within reason. Okay, scope of business. Um, it goes without saying that the scope of business should be um, clearly defined. Um, it should relate to the business of the employer, and it should circle back to cover the work that was undertaken by the employee during the course of the employment. Now, it's always safest to make sure that you refer to the course of the employee during a certain period of the employment. So it's usually the last 12 months. Um, if you've got somebody who's worked for 20 years, you're not necessarily restricting him from doing anything that he ever did in those 20 years. It's really the last 12 months, possibly 24 months, of, the, um, of his, uh, his employment with the employer. Um, if you did seek to impose a restriction over work that the employee did historically and not recently, um, arguably um, that would be unenforceable. Quite often, uh, post-termination restrictions include some introductory wording um, or, or recitals if it's in a separate agreement. They can be very much double-edged. If you do include introductory wording, then the court is going to construe the post-termination restrictions in the rest of the clause within the confines of that introductory wording. And so you need to be either very precise as to um, the business interests that you're seeking to protect, or what usually happens is you're sort of vastly wide and general that the introductory wording doesn't really add that much. Um, if you don't do this, and, and there are cases that I can't put my hands on at the moment, where the judge has essentially said, okay, this restriction that you're seeking to argue sounds fine, but your introductory wording confines it to a different area, and therefore I'm not prepared to enforce the restriction because you have to sort of be bound by your own. Here we are. If the employer nails his colors to the mast, he is stuck to those colors and that mast, uh, countrywide assured financial services. And so um, if, if you do sort of want to limit yourself that way, then you're going to be stuck with that limitation. That being said, introductory wording can be an assistance. One of the things that um, clever counsel like Earl will do in court when trying to argue that a restriction is unenforceable is they will try and stretch what that um, restriction seeks to cover. And sometimes they come up with very fanciful examples of, of course this couldn't do this because it would prevent him from ever being a uh, tea uh, assistant or a, a maid in a firm or, or you know, be, uh, doing secretarial duties because it's so widely worded he couldn't do this and so it has to be unenforceable. If you do include introductory wording, what it does is it prevents um, essentially counsel from being able to argue sort of fanciful interpretations of the restrictive covenants because, um, as I say, the judge will interpret it in accordance with the, the, the confines of the introductory words. And so double-edged sword, um, it can make an otherwise too wide restriction um, enforceable by sort of narrowing its scope. Uh, but also, if you're too narrow in your introductory wording, you could end up killing the rest of the restrictions. Um, I mentioned it here financial compensation. Um, briefly said earlier, Hong Kong uh, essentially follows the same concept in the UK, which I think is the same as Singapore and a number of other common law jurisdictions which don't require um, compensation to be paid during a uh, non-compete period. Um, essentially, the earnings that the employee um, received during the course of their employment is sufficient compensation for the post-termination restriction afterwards. Um, I know the position is different on the continent and I believe in China where you've got to pay um, a proportion of a, the monthly wage on a monthly basis. This all being said, if a judge is looking at a restriction and the judge is somewhat on the fence, as to whether the restriction's enforceable or not, and you're seeking an injunction, and the judge needs to um, balance the interests of both sides, and compensation is being paid, then that might be sufficient to persuade a judge 
that an injunction should be granted because the employee isn't without um, compensation during that period of time. And so it wouldn't make an otherwise unenforceable restriction enforceable. But certainly if the judge is sort of wavering where the balance of probabilities is or the balance of convenience um, in a case, then making payment to the employee um, could be sufficient to push him um, in favour of granting the injunction. Um, and then we've got drafting and ambiguity. Um, the typical rules of contra preferentum apply. Um, I can't think of any circumstances where an employee would go to an employer with post-termination restrictions and go, I've drafted these, I want to be bound by them. They would always come from the employer. And so if the employer has essentially screwed up in the drafting, left ambiguities, for example, then it's going to be construed against the employer. And then we've got the blue pencil test. OK. Uh, fortunately for us, um, the UK Supreme Court's come to our aid and considered the blue pencil test in quite a bit of detail in a case called Tillman versus Egon Zender Limited. Um, the facts of the case are, it's, sorry, it's not marked on the slide, it's from 2019, the Supreme Court judgment. Um, the facts of the case are fairly typical. Um, it's uh, an executive whose contract contains a non-compete restriction. Uh, she brings her own uh, employment to an end. She resigns to move to a competitor. Uh, the company argues that moving to a competitor would be a breach of the non-compete. And she says the restriction is void because essentially it's too wide. It's unreasonable. Um, in this case, um, it involved an executive search company. Um, and she, uh, Ms. Tillman, was required to work in the financial services area. She was pro promoted many times and she became global um, joint global head. Her contract included a six-month non-compete, um, and the non-compete said that Ms. Tillman was directly or was prevented from directly or indirectly engaging or being concerned or interested in any business carried on in competition, et cetera, et cetera, in the previous 12 months. Ms. Tillman left the employment. She said, I will abide by all of my other um, non-competition restrictions, uh, sorry, non-compete restrictions, sorry, post-termination restrictions, so the non-soliciting, non-dealing, but I will not abide by the non-competition restriction because it's too wide. And essentially what she was saying is the words in the contract which said, or interested in, um, made the clause incredibly wide because it means that she couldn't own one share in a competitor. Um, so she couldn't own a, a, a tiny interest in a competing business which would have no impact on her previous employer whatsoever. The case went through the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court. The Court of Appeal focused on the words interested in um, and said that, yes, that does make the clause too wide. It means you can't even have a minority interest in a, a competitor, you know, holding one share in a listed company that may be a competitor. And the employer said, well, why don't we blue pencil this? And by blue pencil, we mean the court can change a clause, usually by deleting words, almost always just by deleting words, sort of severing that provision to make an otherwise unenforceable clause enforceable. So if the court was just to delete the words interested in, then that would sort of uh, resolve the, the problem in the drafting and the clause would be enforceable. Um, but the court uh, of appeal um, essentially said that no, that's not an appropriate use of the blue pencil test and, and didn't apply it. And so the case was um, appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court focused on the usual starting points. And so they said the non-competition covenant is indeed a restraint of trade. And the starting point is that it's unenforceable unless you can show that it's enforceable and goes no further than necessary to protect legitimate business interests. The employer, previous employer, didn't try and redefine what all interested in means and essentially said that it should have its natural meaning. And so the only thing that fell for the court to decide was whether the or interested in could be severed. Could you delete that from the restriction to make the unreasonable restraint of trade reasonable? And there are two authorities that essentially the court was asked to consider, the Atwood and Lamont Authority, which is 1920, so I apologize for historic authorities, um, and Beckett, which is 2007 authority. Um, and ultimately, the courts preferred the approach in Beckett, which is the more modern approach. And it said, in order to work out whether we can use the blue pencil or not, 
we need to answer the following three questions. So is the unenforceable provision capable of being removed without adding or modifying the wording of what remains? And so can you delete it without modifying or changing the essentially underlining meaning of the, contra uh, the, the clause? Um, are the remaining terms continue to be supported by adequate consideration? And then does the removal of the unenforceable provision substantially change the character of the contract? And when they applied that um, three tests, they essentially said, yep, our interest in it is capable of being removed. We don't need to add or modify the wording. Consideration is still in place, and it doesn't change the overall effect uh, of the restraints. Um, almost certainly, um, the Tillman case would be followed in Hong Kong. Um, it's a UK Supreme Court case. Um, somewhat uh, embarrassingly, um, we had a case where in order to uh, defend against an injunction, we relied on the Tillman case, but at the Court of Appeal level, where the Court of Appeal said, no, we're not allowed to delete the or interested in provision, and we succeeded on that. Um, had we relitigated that case again today with the Supreme Court overturning the Court of Appeal judgment, uh, I'm not sure we would be so successful. The next, the next question we need to ask is, when assessing reasonableness, when do you run that assessment from? When do you start assessing what is reasonable? The answer is the time that the contract is made, um, and that's um, been in place since 1965. We've got the contract on page, and they say um, you always look at uh, the contract at the time it's entered into, but you can, to a certain extent, be somewhat forward-looking. Um, as to what the contract's intended to cover in the future. And so if, um, if you enter into a, a post-termination restriction and at that stage you're a junior employee and the expectation was that you, you know, remain in that junior role, but for some reason you're promoted all the way up to, to CEO um, and nobody updates or renews your contract, if you leave and move to a competitor, if you have a post-termination restriction that a you know, confined you when you're in that junior role probably isn't enforceable. Um, you, know, you shouldn't restrict junior people to that extent. And that's when they would assess it from, not necessarily where you are now. Um, for reasons I'll come on to, um, solicitors are forever talking to their clients about renewing and updating and reissuing post-termination restrictions. Um, it's not just as a sort of marketing effort to generate business. There is a, a real reason behind it. And that's because if you don't bring restrictions up to date, especially when promoting employees and employees are getting access to greater amounts of confidential data, uh, greater responsibilities, greater duties, then um, the restrictions that apply to them when they first started their employment aren't necessarily going to be enforceable. And this is a case of Pat Systems versus um, Neely, which is a 2012 case. Uh, in that case, for some reason, the employer conceded that the post-termination restriction would not have been enforceable at the time that the employee started employment, but see, uh, sought to say that the post-termination restriction um, should be applicable when he left employment because of his increased and more senior role. The court essentially didn't agree um, and said that since the restriction was unenforceable when he started his employment, it's unenforceable ab initio. It's unenforceable from the very start. And so um, the court um, can disregard it unless the, the clause itself is, is re-agreed. Um, they went so far to say um, something along the lines of uh, it's unpalatable um, for the court to sort of seek to constantly roll over an unenforceable agreement um, as the person increases role, because you know it wasn't enforceable at the start, it can't be rolled over to make it more enforceable. In that particular case, and, and what we see nine times out of ten, when the employee was being promoted, and the employee was promoted several times, the promotion was confirmed on a simple letter, which essentially said, you know, your new salary is this, your new benefits are this, and perhaps you know, your notice period has increased from one month to three months to recognise the seniority. And the letter then said, and all other terms shall remain the same. And so the other terms that remain the same are essentially the unenforceable non-compete restriction. And so that doesn't get sort of increased with the employee. 
And so in light of this case, um, it's imperative that when you do issue new, in contra uh, new sort of promotions or, or people proceed through the ranks, that you do more than just issue sort of notice letters to increase their salary, job title, notice periods. Uh, consideration should be given to fully re-signing um, new employment contracts, which include new and tailored post-termination restrictions for them. And possibly even going further than that, possibly even explaining to the employee, sort of doing the sort of denning red finger, pointing to the restrictions to go, you know, with your seniority, you're now required to sign this contract, which includes these new restrictions. Um, and in that way, you will prevent yourself from falling into the trap of um, the employees, uh, the, the post-termination restrictions being interpreted based on the employee when they started employment rather than when they finished their employment. This being said, all is not lost, and there is some wiggle room to this rule. Um, and we can see on the slide we mentioned reasonable expectation at the time the parties entered into the contract. And so if there's a general expectation that somebody is going to start in a role and proceed through the ranks or, or increase in seniority or take on more responsibilities, then it can be argued that because of that anticipation, the restriction should be, so essentially, the, the interpretation of the restriction should develop with the employee. So there's a case, um, Alan Jones and Joe Hull, where a junior lawyer was hired um, and signed up to post-termination restrictions when they were a junior lawyer. But when they were hired, there was the expectation that that person would become a partner in the firm. And so because of that expectation, when the person left, it, we were able to look at the restriction um, as if the person was a partner. Um, similarly, uh, Croesus versus Bradshaw, um, an unqualified independent financial advisor, you know, started at the very, very bottom of the pile with a post-termination restriction. But the anticipation was always that that person would essentially take over, I think, from the father and take over the business of the company. And therefore, you were able to um, look at the post-termination restriction in the person's sort of inflated or, or more senior role. What this um, brings us on to is a um, recent case of BFAM, um, Capital Partners versus Mills. Um, this is a case where the judgment came out, I should remember, um, in late October, uh, 30th of uh, September uh, last year. Um, it deals with all of the issues that I've just discussed, and so it's quite a good case for bringing everything together. So it deals with when a uh, restrictive covenant should be assessed. Um, in this case, Mills was engaged as a technology consultant with BFAM. Um, BFAM's a, a, essentially an um, asset manager. Um, and he was engaged initially on a fixed-term contract for, I think, six months. And the fixed-term contract included post-termination restrictions, including a six-month non-compete. After only four months, um, the guy was doing very well, and he was offered permanent employment. And when he accepted that permanent employment, it was confirmed by way of the simple letter that we talked about a minute ago, which just referred to his new job title, his new salary, um, and there may or may not have been a change to his notice period. Um, and then it said all other terms essentially remained the same. Within about six months of him signing that second letter, his line manager, the chief technology officer, um, fell ill, and Mr. Mills needed to act up into that role. And so the post-termination restrictions that he originally signed up to uh, were for a six-month fixed term as a technology consultant. But within about one year, he found himself as the chief technology officer of the business. Um, obviously, as chief technology officer, he has incredible amount of responsibility, access to information, confidential data, sensitive information, etc., um, that it possibly wasn't envisaged he would be privy to when he was just the technology consultant. About one year after this, and so um, he'd been in the role, acting role of chief technology officer about one year, he gave notice to terminate his employment, um, and it was obvious that he was going to join a competitor. And so BFAM issued the usual notices to him to say, uh, you're subject to a six-month non-compete. <laughs> we intend to enforce that non-compete restriction against you. Um, essentially, make sure you abide by it uh, and, and, and you know, follow your restrictions. Um, and the message that came back from Mills was like, yes, of course I will. I acknowledge my non-compete. I'll abide by it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he didn't. Um, 
hence why there's a case. Um, he didn't, and he started with a competitor during the restricted period. Now, at first, our client didn't know that he'd started with a competitor. He sort of done it quite sort of well under the radar. And so it was about six weeks, a couple of months or so, after he joined with the competitor, when our client first found out that he was in breach of his restrictions. Uh, before that, in friendly conversations and the like, he gave the impression that, um, yes, he was sitting out of the market, he was behaving, he was doing um, as was expected of him, uh, when he wasn't at all. And so our client, um, BFAM, was naturally aggrieved and you know, essentially sought um, a cease and desist, or issued cease and desist letters against him, uh, which were ignored on the basis that he said that the non-compete restriction isn't binding, it's void, um, it's, it's unreasonable. And we'll come on to his arguments why in a minute. Um, BFAM disagreed, uh, commenced proceedings against him, uh, and essentially had to overcome a series of obstacles in order to succeed in the injunction. The first obstacle is, as we've talked about, that um, they needed to establish that non-competes necessary to protect legitimate business interests. Now, in this particular case, we're covering essentially financial services, sort of sophisticated financial products, and intellectual technology associated with them. So the nature of the work he was doing was incredibly technical. Um, therefore, in order to show a court, and since we're doing this at injunction stage, it's all done by affidavit evidence in a very short order, we needed to produce sort of voluminous detailed evidence um, which essentially said that the company had legitimate business interests to protect, um, and then set out what uh, Mr. Mill's role was in the, in, uh, in, um, in the business and why he had access to such confidential and sensitive information that um, he needed to be restricted from using uh, with a competitor. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, Mr. Mill's um, main line of defence was relying on interpreting when the contract, sorry, when does the, when do you assess reasonableness? Uh, the PAT systems case that we said, which is when he signed up to that post-termination restriction, he was nothing like the chief technology officer he was when he left the employment. He was just a consultant on a temp contract. Um, the court um, was unable to accept um, his submissions in this regard for a number of reasons. Uh, they said that he was approaching it with reference to the wrong time frame. And the court acknowledged that it's common ground that when you assess reasonableness, uh, it's the time the contract is entered into. However, that does not follow that evidence about matters that happened after the making of the contract are irrelevant. They said that it's key that the uh, court has to ascertain the party's intentions that were comp uh, contemplated at the time the contract was entered into. Um, and therefore, if the party's anticipation or contemplation at the time the contract was entered into envisaged that he would grow into this greater role, then the post-termination restrictions can be um, viewed with regard to that greater role. Um, and so the court said, you know, in the past they've considered that it's of course permissible to take into account that an employee might be promoted when looking at reasonableness. Mr. Mills said, when I was hired, I was only on a fixed-term contract for six months. Our position was that that's not necessarily true. Uh, there was a strong expectation that he would be offered permanent employment. And as the chronology showed, um, he didn't even see out his six months before he was offered that permanent role. He was offered within four months. And so he did have permanent employment very quickly. And also, during those pre-discussions with Mr. Mills, it was said that essentially the company would be looking for a path for him to be chief technology officer one day. And so it was very much envisaged at the time that he um, would have this promotion, this career path, where he would have the, the bigger, more senior role. And that is something that actually he didn't disagree with in evidence. Um, essentially he agreed that uh, when he took on the role, there was a path to him becoming chief technology officer. Uh, the next test was essentially that um, Mr. Mills was not in possession of any confidential information. Um, you know, data in an industry like this is so massive, no one could ever memorize it. Um, he hadn't taken with him any confidential information. I don't believe anybody alleged that he had. Um, and so they're saying he didn't have any confidential information that he could make use of. Again, we had to put forward voluminous evidence as to the role that uh, Mr. Mills did 
And the fact that he wasn't there sort of line by line looking at data, but he was very much sat side by side with the um, uh, strats uh, on the trading desks and understood the strategies and the intentions of the trading desk, not necessarily to the point where he was akin to a trader, but to the point where he had um, that level of de uh, data and detail, which is something he could remember and carry with him. Um, and then to say that that is essentially confidential, highly sensitive information that needs to be protected. They then argued that um, six months is unreasonable. Um, and so that's another point that we needed to challenge. And again, um, we put forward evidence that talked about the life cycle of the data that uh, Mr. Mills had and that that life cycle of the data, either the data as it's useful to the client or if it's, say, a trading strategy when it becomes known in the market, is about six months. And the judge accepted that in order to determine that um, six months was reasonable. We then needed to face the hurdle of, well, surely you should use a less onerous restriction um, and referred to the non-solicitation and non-poaching restrictions in his contract. Um, which, in this particular case, wasn't one of the strongest arguments. He wasn't face-to-face, -face, he wasn't client-involved, everything else, and so non-solicit, non-dealing, non-poaching doesn't really get him very far. And so the court was quite ready to accept that, really, um, if there is legitimate business, in, to be, sorry, legitimate business interest to be protected, then they would have to be done by a non-compete. One of the other sort of lesser form restrictions wouldn't be good enough. Uh, the court also then considered um, the usual tests of balance and convenience. In this particular case, um, Mr. Mill's um, employment contract did not require um, BFAM to make payment to him during the six-month period. However, the client volunteered this uh, when he left employment and indeed when they thought that he was sitting out of the market, made payments. Um, the judge took this into consideration and when working out where the prejudice was and since the employee would be compensated because the client undertook to continue to pay, then um, it was determined that the balance of convenience fell in our client's favour and the injunction was put in place. And so um, BFAM is a very contemporaneous case, which as you can see, um, we had essentially all of the key hurdles that we talked about earlier that we needed to overcome in order to, um, to succeed in the application. Okay. And so remedies, that's essentially a case that I've talked about that talks about an injunction. And quite often, um, post-termination restriction, producer for duty, duties, etc. cases, um, Injunction is what everybody looks at, um, to the point where it's almost boring, because I know you guys, there's a huge proportion of lawyers amongst you, um, and you probably know the, the cases on um, you know, what you need to establish to get an injunction, uh, American cyanide and everything else, very easily. So we don't propose to focus on that um, that much in this presentation. Uh, more interestingly, uh, we're going to look at damages, um, which is something that is rare um, for the reasons that I'm sure Earl's going to go into. Um, but I think probably a bit more interesting to conclude the presentation. I think we have 10 minutes left. Or? Then you could have to do it very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, just very quickly on damages. It's actually very rare in Hong Kong to get a case, an employment case, that goes all the way uh, to trial and damages, um, especially for misuse of confidential information or breach of fiduciary duties. Or post termination restrictions. Or, or PTRs, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, but but um, the, 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 the basis of damages for misuse of confidential information um, is usually tied into uh, basically profit or royalty with interest. And they, the, the test is from the general tire case. And for misuse of information, um, where you get a head start, like the Force India one that I talked about, and also in Vestigard Franson, um, the court will use, will try to assess as best as it can with imperfect information the amount of time it took uh, to come up with the new chemical, to come up with the new CAD drawing. Um, or if it's an ongoing product, the percentage of royalty for X number of years. Um, so if there is a case that goes to damages and if it is product related, then that would be the basis of compensation. Um, for services, um, it's actually much more difficult 
And so I think the, 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 the courts usually try to apply the general tire principles to that. Um, for breach of fiduciary duties, there's two forms which are now recognized. One is equitable compensation, um, and I've cited uh, some cases there. But the difficulty with equitable compensation, and I think something that Adam might touch upon quickly later, is the difficulty of causation, yeah. um, of trying to establish that your breach of fiduciary duties has caused the employer this type of damage. Um, in cases of diversion of business interest, it's slightly easier, but just for, for example, not informing your employer about a store open next door, um, how can the court assess that? I think that's where a lot of uh, the damages and equitable compensation fail. Um, there is an interesting case of Hosking and Marathon Asset Management. And in fact, this was a decision of an arbitrator. And then uh, the arbitrator, in fact, assessed damages on two uh, levels. One was equitable compensation, and then the second was a forfeiture of a profit share. So uh, this was in relation to a LPA partnership. So um, the forfeiture was uh, justified on appeal uh, by the English High Court on the basis that for a fiduciary, um, the, the, there is a public interest element to deter breaches of fiduciary. And notwithstanding the fact that the forfeiture is a profit share, was much higher than the equitable composition as assessed of uh, coming up to some 10 million pounds. Um, the public interest necessitated and justified the, um, the, the, the disgorgement of that profit in that case. Um, there has been an attempt in the UK to seek the same forfeiture principles to sort of circumvent the causation difficulties uh, on salary. Um, but this was, uh, this, this was first attempted in the Bank of Ireland and Jeffrey case. And so in that case, what happened was that there was a banker who was doing self-dealing and getting secret profits on the side. Um, and those secret profits were disgorged. Um, at the same time, the bank sought to forfeit uh, the salary of up to five years plus bonus of the banker, uh, because that was the period of time in which the wrongdoing took place. But the court held that it was very difficult for a judge um, to, or, or even on the evidence, to separate the good work that the employer was doing during that time period and his wrongdoing. And so therefore, um, justice had already been served by disgorging the secret profits that he uh, earned uh, on account of his wrongdoing. And so therefore, left the door slightly open, but um, it was a very, very narrow gap as to whether or not uh, a, a forfeiture for salary could be uh, an established as a, as, a, as a form of remedy. Um, in Gamtronic Limited um, and Robert Hamilton, the more recent English case, this was unfortunately a striking out case um, where the employer sought uh, forfeiture in its pleadings and the employee relying on Jaffrey um, and some of the authorities to essentially say you can't forfeit salary. Uh, the English court um, refused to strike out and so left the door and the, the gap a little bit wider um, because he said one needs to look at the facts to see or not whether or not uh, it should be forfeiture in the sense of disgorgement or forfeiture in the form of equitable compensation still requiring the but-for test uh, in relation to salary. So um, that case has uh, probably settled. There's no subsequent case decided on on, on these principles. Um, and so th these are uh, just some interesting um, developments in English case law in relation to damages that may be applicable or may be receptive uh, in a Hong Kong court here. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay, for, for post-termination restrictions, um, as Earl said, it, it's very unusual um, to have a case that goes all the way through to trial where essentially what we're looking for is damages. Um, that's why injunctive relief exists, because damages are notoriously difficult to prove. Uh, possibly even uh, the employee may breach a rest uh, restriction, but it actually results in no damages uh, to the employer. But that doesn't mean that you, know, you don't have some sort of restitution against the employee. And so the starting position is, is essentially um, damages are to put the 
I suppose in this case, the, the previous employer in the same position as he would have been in had the contract not been breached. Um, in order to do that, um, the employee is sorry, the employer is going to have to prove their net loss um, as a result of the breach of contract. Um, they're going to have to show causation, and the causation is not to be too remote, sort of usual Hadley and Baxendale and everything else. Um, and they're also under a duty to mitigate. Um, and so with all of that in mind, yes, there are a couple of cases that you see uh, regarding sales. Um, I suppose in a solicitor's context, if, um, you know, if somebody poaches a client, then you know what the past year's billings have been. Let's say it's a very even client. It's sort of a trademark portfolio where um, essentially um, the billings on the file are the same every year. It's not going to be onerously difficult to work out what net profits are. Uh, but for most other businesses, um, it's, it's nigh on impossible. Um, unfortunately, not something I've been called upon to do. Um, there's also the concept of restitutionary and gain-based damages. Um, now, the test for this um, was essentially where a claimant has not suffered any loss, or you cannot establish the loss, or the loss is proportionately less, then you could seek damages based on a sort of restitu rest restitutionary basis. Um, and you could look at that with reference to the profit that the defendant has, which isn't quite the same as um, uh, a requirement for account of profits. Uh, the difficulty I have with all of this is um, the Supreme Court relatively recently, probably about three years ago, um, somewhat changed the rules again with Morris Gardner on one step, uh, where restitutionary and gain-based damages weren't seen as punitive, but now... I don't believe that they're favoured anymore. And so um, in terms of, of damages for straightforward breach of post-termination restrictions, um, it's, a very, it's a very sort of complicated and murky area to work out what it is that you can actually recover under what heads. Um, and this is certainly one of those situations where I'd be running to council <laughs> and placing the burden with council to assist on this because it's, it's a very complex area. The, the other thing is... Typically, if you're going to have a case that goes this far, there's probably going to be elements of um, breach of confidence or something like that in there. And the, the damages for account of profits, um, I think, are more readily available in a case of breach of confidence than um, post-termination restrictions, which I think would be absolutely exceptional on a, on a standalone basis. Um, and so, as I say, uh, we're, we're touching on this and, and sort of highlighting the relevant case law on it. Um, but I think what people need to do is probably go back and, and read the Supreme Court Morris Gardner One Step uh, Judgment, and I apologise for not putting that up on the slides, um, and, and, and then to sort of bring people up to speed, but it's something that develops quite a lot. Yeah. Um, Labour Tribunal or High Court, um, just to conclude, uh, I think we can deal with this quite quickly. Um, Earl mentioned that the Labour Tribunal has authority to deal with um, claims for breach of contract, uh, but not claims in tort. Um, in your presentation, I think the conclusion was that breach of fiduciary duties would be fall under a breach of contract claim. Well, yes. So um, I think that for breaches of fiduciary duty that arise from a contractual from an employment situation. relationship, yeah. yeah. Equity is imposed from and through the contract. That would not preclude the district, uh, the, the Labour Tribunal's exclusive jurisdiction. Um, and so that case, uh, or that situation was sort of, but not really considered um, in two cases in Hong Kong. One more recently in 2020, and which sort of muddies the water a little bit and a uh, more detailed uh, uh, judgment in 2013, which uh, I would say uh, is a, a much uh, clearer decision uh, to rely on and to advise clients upon. So j just to um, highlight this 2020 decision, which I won't really go into too much detail, um, the, what, what happened was that the company in question uh, went to the presiding officer and attended the tribunal hearing all by themselves without any uh, uh, assistance from solicitors or counsel, uh, from solicitors advising in the background. 
And they basically presented their claims as a factual claim and complained a lot about the employee's misconduct. And the presiding officer there just focused on uh, the uh, outstanding commissions that were due to be paid to the employee in question um, and didn't consider the complaints of the employer. And so on appeal, um, the, uh, the, 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 the argument on appeal was simply saying that, well, the presiding officer ought to have considered the breach of confidence, the uh, retention of the use of confidential information, as well as the breaches of fiduciary duty because this guy was senior enough to be a director grade. Um, the Court of First Instance dismissing the appeal basically held that uh, the presiding officer, it, it's sort of a roundabout sort of decision um, when, when, re, when one reads it. Basically, the, preside, uh, the judge said, because breach of confidence was mentioned and fiduciary duties can possibly arise as a matter of tort, therefore the presiding officer was correct in holding that, uh, correct in not investigating or not having uh, carrying out any inquiry in relation to the complaints by the uh, employer about the employee's misconduct. Um, but that's very difficult to square with the case of noble spirit, um, where the high court basically there said, one has to look at whether or not the misconduct in question arose in tort or in uh, contract. And, and as I indicated just now, the fiduciary duty aspect in noble spirit was held to arise from contract, equity imposed through contract. And so therefore, uh, the, in noble spirit, the court did strike out uh, the defendant employee in question uh, and said without, that, that was without prejudice to the employer to go back to the labor tribunal to commence the claim against the employee there. Um, the, so so, I, I, so the, an, another area in which um, Li Yu Hong sort of didn't really deal with, the, the judge didn't really deal with the case, was the obligation of the uh, presiding officer to make inquiries or to transfer uh, cases which had elements of tort, uh, which was uh, excluded from its jurisdiction under Section 10 of the LTO. So um, if a presiding officer uh, had heard complaints about misconduct that was tortious, then in her reasoning, uh, in, in, in the reasoning, the, the presiding officer ought to uh, explain why she didn't transfer as well. I don't think that was done, and that issue was not taken up on appeal as well. But th that would be another thing to consider as to whether or not Li Yu Hong uh, stands in good authority. There's a couple of other good authorities, like Gainhill, uh, for example, um, that, that do set out the position more clearly. So I, I would caution people uh, reading Li Yu Hong and thinking that all cases must uh, commence in the High Court when it comes to um, breach of fiduciary duties. Yeah, I, I would be incredibly cautious um, for any claim uh, relating to employment you know, other than injunctions that fall within exclusive jurisdiction of the High Court, starting them in the High Court uh, without first going to the Labour Tribunal. Um, there are a few authorities. Uh, there's Deutsche Bank versus um, Blanco. Um, which was a case that was started in the High Court and the first thing that uh, happened was they sought to strike it out on the basis that it should have been started in the Labour Tribunal. Uh, in that particular case, uh, the, the bank Deutsche was seeking um, some equitable remedies, declaratory relief as to post-termination restrictions and the like. Um, and I think the employee sought to argue that um, they were window dressing. They tried to, try to window dress the case um, to have an air of, of, of tort or equity to it to start it in the High Court to avoid the Labour Tribunal. Um, in that case, um, Deutsche Bank got away with it. Uh, it was held that it was appropriate for it to be in the High Court and what they did was more than just mere window dressing. Uh, but I would, be, I would be very cautious about starting any claim for damages connected to employment directly in the High Court. Uh, one case that springs to mind is a case, I can't remember the employer's name, but the, uh, the individual is called Borche, and his was a claim for, I think, commissions or unpaid wages, um, but due to various complicating factors, it was started, I think, in the district court, and it went, I think, pretty much up to trial, it, it, maybe even at pre-trial review stage, and the court looked at it and accepted a, a very late application from the employer to essentially sever out huge amounts of the claim 
that related to employment on the basis that it wasn't started in the Labour Tribunal. And so in that particular case, you know, the guy who'd been fighting the case for two or three years was on the doorstep of trial, um, and the, the defendant suddenly noticed that you know, half the claim should have been started elsewhere properly, and it was, it was, it was kicked out at the last minute. And, so it, and the reason for this is because the High Court doesn't have jurisdiction to go, oh, OK, then, we can sort of correct this mistake, it's within my power. Um, the issue of being able to, or how you litigate a, a Labour Tribunal case is a matter of jurisdiction um, set out in the Labour Tribunal Ordinance, and it's really, I think, only a presiding officer that can refer a case to the High Court. Um, the other way around can't happen. It's not like a, a High Court judge can sort of dip down and bring up a Labour Tribunal case. Um, this being said, um, if a case is sufficiently complex, if there are proceedings started in the High Court and the Labour Tribunal, etc., typically the Labour Tribunal will be very quick to refer the case to the High Court um, and so they can be joined together and dealt with together. Uh, the Labour Tribunal recognises that you know, the High Court's a higher authority, the risk of appeal is very high, um, the, um, the desire to make sure that there aren't conflicting decisions, especially between a Labour Tribunal and a High Court. Um, is paramount, and so um, I think it's always prudent to start in the Labour Tribunal and then pretty much at the first hearing, uh, possibly even have submissions prepared for the client to argue why the case should be going to the High Court. Um, and if there are High Court proceedings that's to be joined with, you know, explain what those proceedings are. Yeah. And just w one more point on that. The Labour Tribunal does have the express statutory power to group hearings together. So that notwithstanding the fact that if you have a team move situation and you have multiple uh, employees uh, being uh, proceeded with in the Labour Tribunal, you can also inf uh, basically ask the presiding officer to group all these considerate all these cases together to be handled and transferred up in one go. Yep. Yep. So um, that that it's not as if you then have to deal with uh, the HR departments will have to deal with uh, 10, 11, 12 uh, sessions uh, or court sessions. Um, so, so that's one of the powers, express powers. Although sometimes when the employees sort of drip feed their cases in, <laughs> the HR's there for a series of first appointments until yeah. finally they get grouped together, which can be quite frustrating. Okay. Um, questions? Questions? Um, am I there? Perfect. Thanks, um, guys, so for sending questions through. <laughs> okay. So we've got two which are very, very similar. Um, the first one is... You seem to suggest that 12 months is the longest duration that the court will enforce for a non-competition clause. I'm aware of several cases where longer restrictions have been upheld. In what circumstances do you think uh, the court will uphold a restriction longer than 12 months? Okay, so, yeah, when I was talking about uh, primarily non-compete restrictions, but uh, I suppose also non-solicit, non-deal, I did talk about 12 months as being sort of the upper... Uh, marker as to what may be considered reasonable. Um, I think in a purely employment context, that's probably right. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some highly unusual outlier cases there where longer than 12 months is justified, 18 months, possibly 24 months. Uh, but as I say, from a purely employment-related um, context, it would be incredibly difficult to go beyond 12 months. Where you see post-termination restrictions, uh, or rather non-compete restrictions, being enforced that are longer than 12 months would be in shareholder agreements, partnership agreements, um, sale and purchase agreements, where the post-termination restriction is, is designed to have another purpose. And so in a sale and purchase agreement, you don't want to sell your company um, and then the person that's just you know, sold the company to you for £10 million pounds, uh, sets up a business next door. You want to restrict from that happening. Um, similarly in shareholder agreements, uh, because there's sort of ownership of the business partnership agreements, um, you quite often see much longer restrictions, and so 24, 36, um, you know, even up to five years and the like. Um, and there are certainly a few of those cases in Hong Kong. Um, but I, I, I can't envisage too many pure employment cases where more than 12 months would be enforceable. No, I haven't seen that myself. Yeah. Um, and the next question was, um, I assume that the employment contracts you're referring to are all subject to Hong Kong law. It is, uh, is it unusual for employees to have regional roles and they met travel to another jurisdiction for their employment? Uh, the classic example is leaving a regional job in Hong Kong and taking up a similar job with a competitor in Singapore. 
can the employers still enforce the restriction in Hong Kong, or, tr or would they try to enforce it in Singapore? Well, I think the, the first question is, does the um, non-restriction clause cover Singapore in the question? And if it does, then uh, as a matter of uh, theoretical enforcement, yes. Um, but then I, I think uh, in Singapore, I am not a Singapore lawyer by, by any means, uh, even though I am Singaporean. Um, <laughs> the, the, I think there is a procedure in which they recognize foreign judgments now, but only in monetary terms. So even if you seek an injunction here, once you get that, you basically have to go to the Singapore High Court again and relitigate that same uh, clause at, and for, for, the, for, for the Singapore court to recognize the Hong Kong injunction order. So um, practically speaking, it's possible, but it will be onerous and difficult to do so. I think, OK, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, it's quite a nice example because they're um, essentially similar law jurisdictions on this point. And so um, you know, uh, Earl was referring to a Singapore case um, that you know, was going to be heavily persuasive in Hong Kong. Um, it, it's the same legal system, so that works quite well. I think what would happen if you had somebody that you know, went from competitor A to competitor, uh, sorry, employer A to competitor, um, and changed um, location from Hong Kong to Singapore, um, probably the, or hopefully, um, the jurisdiction clause would be non-exclusive jurisdiction. Um, if it was a monetary judgment you're looking for, then yes, you could sue in Hong Kong and then seek to enforce the money in Singapore later. But if you're looking for an injunction, I think you would probably go to Singapore and look for an injunction, assuming it's covered. Um, and then in doing that, Singapore would look to Hong Kong law, because the contract's governed by Hong Kong law, but also interpret it in accordance with its own um, public policy, because restraint of trade in many jurisdictions is a public policy issue. Um, and so I, I think Hong Kong, Singapore is an, e an easier example than, for example, if you were to say, um, trying to enforce a non-compete from Hong Kong in uh, mainland China or in Europe or somewhere like that because you know, Hong Kong drafted non-compete probably won't provide for financial consideration. But if you're going to enforce that sort of uh, clause or trying to enforce that clause um, under German law, uh, France, wherever, um, they, they would probably strike it down as contrary to public policy because there is no compensation being paid. And so I think um, in order to enforce cross-border, uh, you need to have both Hong Kong law considerations and then whatever the relevant local law considerations are. Um, mm. th this, this is all talking about injunctions, I suppose, rather than damages. Damages is, is much easier. Um, you, know, you, you get an order for damages in Hong Kong, you enforce it overseas. But to seek an injunction, um, you probably need to argue the injunction under Hong Kong and then the overseas legal system. Um, and hopefully what you're doing um, fits both. Yeah. Um, the next question is, can restrictive covenants survive a repertory breach of contract by the employer? In the case of Brown versus Neon Management Services, a UK case, the court found in favour of the employers that a restrictive covenant is unenforceable following termination of an employment contract by employee's acceptance of an employer's reputation. Is that the position in Hong Kong? Are there any cases in Hong Kong? Um, I'm actually dealing with a case right now in Hong Kong uh, in relation to whether or not uh, constructive dismissal by the employer in question uh, because they failed to disclose uh, certain criminal wrongdoings uh, in breach of their license. Um, and withholding such information from the employees when they resign, uh, or when they signed the new contracts to renew their contracts. Um, in, in, in that research which I did, my, I, I, I don't think there was a specific Hong Kong case, but we were relying basically on the, I think the UK position that uh, constructive dismissal um, and wrongdoing in, in effect kills the uh, restraint of trade. Um, I think that's, that's, that was the position I took in court. Unfortunately, um, parties settled on the injunction on certain undertakings being given, so there was no judgment on that. Um, we'll probably have to wait to trial 
uh, if it goes to that, on, on to, to have a Hong Kong authority as to whether uh, misconduct by the employer amounting to constructive dismissal would in effect uh, uh, vis uh, treat, the, the court would then treat the uh, restrictive covenants in question as uh, void or, or as expired. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember the UK case on, what was the case that you said again? Because there is a case which said... It's the case of Brown versus Neon Management Services Limited. Okay, that doesn't ring a bell. Um, there, is, there, is, there is UK case law that does say um, the simple fact that there's a constructive dismissal does not necessarily void the entire contract, especially um, the post-termination restrictions. Um, I know that there's flip-flopping opinions on this um, when that case was being decided. Um, the other thing that you see quite often to deal with this, and since I'm dealing with express clauses, is you write into the contract. Um, you know, upon termination of your reason, howsoever caused, and, and some of them are even more aggressive that, you know, even if it's constructive dismissal, this clause will, and so it writes into the contract um, expressly that it's to survive termination, even if it's a termination for um, constructive dismissal. And I think in a case like that, coupled with the authority I'm thinking of, but I can't quite remember. If you can get the name of the person, I can dig it up. Um, th that's, that's likely to mean that, let's say you can't just simply ignore the post-termination restriction because you can prove a cons uh, constructive dismissal. It, it's still, it's not automatically void. It's still something that would need to be considered. Yeah. Um, the next question is, can the proceedings be transferred to the district court instead of the high court? Yes, yes. 100%. Uh, the test is nowadays $3 million, and so if you're suing for less than $3 million, um, the Labour Tribunal will send it to the District Court. If you're suing for more than $3 million, um, it will go to the High Court. I think, I think that's why you see more District Court cases dealing with employment disputes nowadays. That was quite rare um, prior to the jurisdictional change for $3 million. Uh, Yeah, it's just shorthand that we've used forever, which is your transfer to the High Court, um, yeah. District Court or High Court. Uh, I think this one is aimed at Earl. Um, in the Force India case, do you think Mercedes will have a claim? Um, that's interesting. Um, the, in, in fact, I think what happened with... This is Mercedes <laughs> asking a question. Yeah. Um, well, in, in fact, Racing Point is the successor to Force India. And I think in the, uh, 20, I, I think in, in the uh, season before this one, um, what happened was Racing Point copied uh, Mercedes to the T and they claim that they did it through uh, photographs. And it's actually quite interesting because I, I, I watched one of the interviews of the aero, uh, the aero engineers. They actually, he actually set out in, 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 in hyper detail the steps that he took to reverse engineer uh, the Mercedes car. And I think basically they were guided by the Force India decision to basically say that, look, we didn't copy, uh, we reverse engineered it from publicly available information. Um, and this time they chose to use the leader's car rather than the uh, than their own, uh, which was. Which so you're saying last. he reversed engineered his testimony to fit the case law? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. But the irony is that Force India also came last in the constructors' championship in that year in which they copied Mercedes. I didn't know you were a fan. <laughs> okay. Um, there's another question here. Is there any conflict of law across jurisdictions regarding non-competing restrictions? and how to preempt such conflicts of law when drafting the restriction clauses? Uh, yes. Um, the, the, the difficulty, the, the, the problem with uh, conflict of law in this context is because you can't remove it because it's, um, because it's a matter of public policy. And so um, quite often you will see um, US contracts always say, you know, this must be dealt with in accordance with um, State uh, courts of New York or FINRA or something like that, without um, reference to conflict of law, and so. You know, but that that tends to be more in connection with the right for the employee to sue the employer. The employer is going to want to give itself the the widest possible ability to sue an employee mm. um, around the world, and because it's a public policy matter, if you're seeking injunctions, um, the the local jurisdiction is always going to apply whatever its public policy is with these things. Nine times out of ten around the world, it's um, restraint of trade is unenforceable unless it can be shown to be reasonable. I think one way to get around it is to basically insert an arbitration clause in, 
um, once you have an arbitration clause, then you uh, don't have to worry about conflicts issues. It can go straight to the arbitrator. The arbitrator will then apply the law of the arbitration clause. And, and that would short circuit everything. And you still get the uh, protective remedy of the local jurisdiction when you go for an injunction, notwithstanding the fact that you can obviously go for uh, injunction through arbitration nowadays as well. But you, you, you have the best of both worlds, I guess. Yeah, that it, that's a, a, a process I've not yet been through. And, and uh, arbitration injunction. That seems to be all the questions. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any more. Apart from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> if we have two people here, they're, they're terrified that we might ask them a question. <laughs> that seems to be everything, guys. Brilliant. Um, then thank you very much, everybody, for uh, staying with us. Hope you are all with us. We, we, have, we have no idea um, who's still online and who's not. Um, hope you found it informative um, and hope you have a great weekend. I think there's going to be a quiz. Oh, yes, we have to send yes. you a quiz in order to get your CPD points. They're not free. <laughs> and so after this, Earl and I will put our heads together and find the most complicated questions uh, to circulate. Um, I think it's true or false. It should be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.